And good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am so excited tonight um, because I get to introduce some people. I, it's only some. I get to introduce some people to easily one of the most powerful black women in industry. And I, I, I qualify it by saying black women because I want people to understand that she is someone who is from our community, for our community, by our community. And so qualifying my next guest as one of the most powerful black women in industry is a way to pay homage to the trails that she is blazing in industries that you have never seen black women in, not at this level. And when you meet her, what you're going to see is that she's somebody who isn't just talking the talk. She's walking the walk, uh, not just in the for-profit world, but in the not-for-profit world. She's making an impact. She's a mother, a wife, and easily one of the coolest sisters you will ever meet. Please join me in welcoming Dia Sims. Oh, hi, Dr. Perry. That's a world-class introduction there. I don't, maybe my mom, my mom might have been able to beat that, but beyond that, I mean, I feel Look, very, very grateful. <laughs> it, 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 how about this? It's understated, um, as you are. Um, you know, I don't think that we get to have the kinds of conversations that you and I have had offline in public. I don't think that people really understand what they're looking at when they see you. Of course, you're gorgeous. Of course, you're smart. They're going to find that out very, very quickly. But what they don't know is that you have blazed a trail in industries that you're the only sister in the room. What is it like to be the only sister in the room? <laughs> it's uh, it's too common uh, is the first problem. And and the truth is, you know, now at 46, it has not changed dramatically from being the only the youngest and the only minority and the only woman. And uh, when I was at Department of Defense at, you know, 21 years old, uh, and it hasn't changed much in the last couple of months in the spirits industry uh, or, or the cannabis industry either. Um, so it's problematic, but I think what we're going to, I think the work that we're doing, the work that you're doing, Dr. Perry, is we are, I, I absolutely see the light of change. Um, and it's just going to be important that we in underserved communities, representing underserved communities, are making that change from within. Where did you get the courage to rip the doors off the hinges? <laughs> hmm, that's a great question. I think um, I, I would kind of always grew up in the sense that if you can solve a problem, it's someone incumbent upon you to do it. Like I can't, um, I think I'm so grateful for time. That's something that was very much instilled in me. Like I don't take for granted any minute, any second, uh, let alone a day. Um, so that said, if there's a, if there's something glaring in front of me and I have absolutely any capacity or capital or opportunity to impact it, I think it's incumbent upon us to take that responsibility. I don't see, and to be honest, I think we should all, because we all struggle with it, right? We're all, everybody, I think every American at this point is going through, you know, you open up the news every day, almost every day is a new level of PTSD from the news you read the day before. I, I think it's actually soothing and therapeutic to be active in the change um, versus um, simmering in this kind of like trauma where we're all facing issues in education and justice and civil rights and equities and economic inequities. I'd rather figure out like, okay, we got 15 problems. We got a, uh, you know, a mothball of problems. I mean, which one can I focus on, right? Like how can we figure out one thing to get right? I'm going to push you through that because I haven't told people who don't know you what it is you do. And there, there are a lot of reasons for that. We're going to talk about that. I don't think what you do is as impressive as who you are. I don't. I think that who you are is far more powerful than where you work. And I've seen you make great people greater and do so in a way that is elegant um, and, and thoughtful. But many people look at the spirits industry, cannabis, and some of the other areas where you find yourself mm -hmm. and 
their reaction is ain't no black people in there, right? Do the right thing. Ain't no black people on the wall. And they, and they want to protest and, and they want to react in a way um, that you don't. You take a different approach. Tell me why you don't look at the absence of black faces, the absence of women, and see that as a deterrent. Yeah, I see it as an opportunity. I'll give you a quick, a short story, and I'll talk a little about the three hundred and fifty-three billion dollars spirits industry, which, by the way, you know, women and black people absolutely participate in every day, just only on one side of the bar, right? So that's what's, what's the side? Because I don't think people really understand yeah, that. Yeah. So the spirits industry is about a three hundred and fifty-three billion dollar industry. It's a and for very those people don't know industry. who never refer to it as spirits, what are you talking about? I'm talking about so this, yeah. So it's a very unique thing, right? Because you're really literally talking about whiskey, tequila, right? Gin, um, rum. It's a handful of spirit, actually foolproof spirits that generate that amount of money. If you think about other sectors and how much complexity there is to get to be a multi-billion dollar industry, we're talking about some good spirits, hopefully if you're doing it right, and some glass bottles and a handful of families that is as much uh, a part of the American history as apple pie, uh, <laughs> baseball, right? Um, and for us not to participate in it, I think is um, reprehensible. And I think we have a we have an opportunity to change it, which is um, I like to talk to you a bit more about is the initiative we are working on now called Pronghorn. I think the thing I would flag is I think the the impetus for like even this kind of approach is like I you know I grew up in Queens, New York mostly, and um, and my father had grown up uh, mostly in Brooklyn, and uh, you know, when he was growing up, very smart, very handsome, he could sing, and but he grew up poor, one of seven kids. And they were like, he said, they basically moved when the rent was due. And, you know, he said he, he had the kind of thing where like aunts would come over and say, you are so talented. If you try your very best, you could be a pimp one day, right? That was his, uh, that was, mm-hmm. he could aspire to that. Um, so I think that said, as he got older and met my mom and he went in the military and he was getting his life right, um, and came back to New York, there was an opportunity to work for the New York police department, which when he grew up, the police were like another gang, right? It was like something that you hated and you feared and you knew that they could change your life and plant things on you. So you had always felt like an aversion to like, I'm not going to be part of the police. I grew up, you know, on the opposite side of that. Um, and then really had an epiphany. I remember I was very young. I was probably like maybe nine. I'm saying like, you know what? If I want to change something, it's actually easier to change it from the inside. Went on, went in to become, and then actually ended up becoming one of the first uh, officers in the history of NYPD to work with internal affairs to lead a task force on how to teach all officers how to have civil engagement in black and brown neighborhoods in New York. Now, obviously, today we see there's work to be done, but every step, you know, who knows what lives that could have been saved from you know five years of that conversation back in, a, in that time. So I think that was like a, a, a upfront seat to saying, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't begrudge a parade or a protest. Um, but what I do look at is the black and white of where we are today is moving too slow. And I think that we have an opportunity to move more quickly if we can participate on a more even playing field economically. And for all the issues we face, if the economic engineering is not right, if the skeleton of the financial base is not right, I think we will continue to be backpedaling and on unstable footing. When <laughs> one of the most important things about you is that you find a way to make things happen with a grace. I, I you know, I refer to you as the uh, velvet glove. <laughs> that you put on top of the steel fist. Um, And again, I'm holding out for people who don't know what you do. They wouldn't know that you are behind uh, two of the black billionaires um, in a very real way and not in a, in a, Oh, that's cute kind of way. (laughs) But I think both of these men, Mm -hmm. both of whom are very talented and very capable and, Ego is the size of their talent. No. Um, and I think both of them would own your role. I don't think either one of them would, in a public or private setting, mm-hmm. say anything other than the role that you played. And we're going to get into that in a moment, just the roles that you played. But I want, there are mothers your age, 
there are sisters who are younger who are watching out there the comments they're really excited about what you're saying already and there are girls in college right now and they don't know what they're going to do i know they all think that they do right they all they got it all figured out at 19 years old like i'm sure you had it figured out you gonna work at the defense department you have this government job right and you're gonna just <laughs> government job <laughs> You you gonna go to Morgan, right? Stable money. That's what we have. That was the first endeavor. Yes. <laughs> and so, how the hell do you end up <laughs> on the top of two of the most important industries to black consumers mm -hmm. as a producer of the product? How do you? Why don't you just stay on the other side of the bar, girl? <laughs> No, that's not that's not happening. That's what I won't do. Um, and then, so I, talk to me about talk yes. to me about how'd you get on the other side of the not just other side of the bar, yeah, but at the front where the leaves are being picked. <laughs> yes, yes, that's right. From the from the uh, from the field to the store, you're right about that. So look, I think um, I definitely am. So I went to HBCU, Morgan State, Go Bears, and uh, majored in psychology because I didn't know if I was going to go to law school or med school and. Uh, my, you know, my parents are incredible, very smart, but I grew up at a time where, you know, those are those, the choices were kind of like lawyer, doctor, good government job, right? Those are the things. Entrepreneurship, which wasn't really, um, I just wasn't really around it. I hadn't even really considered it in a meaningful way. Although I always had a little bit of a bent doing things and helping out the, the mixtapes and that kind of stuff, right? To try to uh, move forward. And I think the real aha moment was I was a promoter in DC with two dear friends. We used to throw these big parties, like a thousand people a week every Wednesday with a gentleman named Mark Barnes, who's a, like a legend in, in DC. He had a small venue called Republic Gardens and it would be open from about 5 p.m. to 2 a.m. And after work with him for about six weeks, I re just really literally sat around one day and did the math in my mind. And I was like, okay, we had about 900 something people tonight. We charge an X amount. They're buying this many cocktails because he was also teaching me about the bar, which obviously came in <laughs> handy later. Um, and I thought, and I just did the math. And I was like, yo, wait a minute. This man is making millions of dollars every year. And at that, that was a revolutionary thing to me. I hadn't, and the other thing was I hadn't really had in my mind, could I make millions? I hadn't really just thought about it. I was just like, I'm going to get a good job and maybe six-figure job and I'll have a good, nice life. But at that moment, at like 23, I was like, this man's making millions of dollars. I should be mad. I can make millions of dollars. Like, I need to reframe the way I'm thinking. And that was a real change. And now today, when I know that the average black business owner is worth any kind of business is worth 12 times the average black non-business owner is, it has completely reframed my thinking. So as you, hopefully, I hope, listen, you're in college or, or you're 63, whatever it is, as you're saying, like, it would be a real risk to not, leave, you know, to leave my job or to own something. Like, nah, it's going to be a risk if you don't own something. That's just a math. You have a skill set, though, that is different. Um, I've seen you catch fish with your bare hands, so to speak. <laughs> Yes. And 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 let me explain to people what that means. <laughs> if you know that in order to catch a fish, you got to trick it, you got to put a hook on, you got to disguise the hook. But you can't just reach your hand in the water. You can't just break the surface and grab it. I've seen you slowly reach your hand into a situation. And by the time your hand is touching the fish, the fish feels comfortable enough to say, all right, take me up with you. How did you develop the skills to work with some really high powered brothers like Sean Combs. How did you, and, and look, I love Puff. And um, how did you at the height of the height mm -hmm. find yourself in the eye of the storm that was bad boy and everything else that it was? Yeah. Good girl that you doing it at bad boy. Yes, sir. I um so just for context, right? I, I worked with Puff for 14 years, right? Um, started off as an executive assistant and then you know was fortunate to grow to become the first president in the history of the company, besides kind of Puff himself. Um and I think that what we had in common was a belief in what other people might view as impossible, right? So let's take away like what we didn't have in common. What we had in common was a level of like, now we can 
we just got to figure out how to get this done. We can get almost anything done, right? So that I think made for a great work partnership and we were able to build incredible things like Ciroc Vodka to become a multi-billion dollar uh, business. Don't jump that. Hold on. We're going to stop. We're going to stop along the way. You can't just say, we. because before that, yeah. the move was to take some Cristal, pour it on some woman, right? Like that was the thing. That was what you did. And, and to rhyme about other people's uh, products, right? And maybe get a check or two. Why the hell did you guys decide we're not, we're tired of selling other people's alcohol. Look, talk well, about that conversation. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, Puff first um, talks about noticing this really with Sean John, where you, we all know this, right? You see, whether this is from Motown or Bad Boy, when the, when the culture was wearing something, it was selling out all across America, right? This was, and he said, look, I, every time I'm doing a video, one of my artists are doing a video, um, I'm selling, I need to own my own thing, right? And that's why he first launched the fashion business of Sean John. And then he started to double down on that in a variety of like lifestyle brands. And he's known as the king of celebration. And to your point, you could take these kind of short-term checks um, to celebrate and promote somebody else's long-term legacy. Um, and I think we had a real conversation around like, well, look, this is, this is an industry where we don't participate. And to be honest, we don't, what I know now is not what I knew then in terms of like how much we don't participate. Um, but we knew there was a hole to be solved. We knew that we could bring a level of, of finesse and business savvy to make the, and a respectful and requited relationship with the customer, right? In a way that wasn't happening at that time in the spirits industry. And we knew we wouldn't do it if we weren't being treated like owners. Um, Cause there's no, there's no long-term gain in it. Um, look, Puff is uh, an enormous visionary and his instincts towards ownership um, really were like really sharpened. I think I had the inclination, but it was like going to the university, right? To, 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 to Oxford <laughs> underneath Puff's guidance. Um, and we did, you know, I talked a little bit about I started my career at the Department of Defense. At that time, I was trained for two years in negotiations, which is something I feel like everybody should have in fifth grade, not just a unique thing I happened to stumble upon. And when I was working as Puff's chief of staff and we were considering this, I said, look, I want to be, don't forget, I'm, I might be good at managing the jets and the homes, but I, I want to be a part of this business negotiation as well. Remember, I'm, tr I'm trained in this. I know this. I was selling $2 million a year in advertising sales before I came here. I want to be on the core team. And then when we negotiated the deal for Ciroc Vodka, I said, I would like to run it. I'd like to reestablish the ad agency. I will go get it funded, um, but I want to run it. And I think the thing that's important is also taking control of your own destiny, no matter where you're being an entrepreneur, you're an actual entrepreneur, but like time is so short and it will go by so fast. And if you're not really having kind of that quarterly business review with yourself in the mirror, It'll be very easy to work very hard and not actually go anywhere. You will be a octopus on roller skates doing a lot of work every day, tired, but you ain't going nowhere. Right. So that's the I think that's the defining piece for me. It's like I, I got to be moving forward if I'm working this hard. When you were because I, I, take us into the room where it happened. Take us through the conversation about, you know what, we should get our own vodka. What does that sound like? I mean, because first of all, when we once up until the time when the Wright brothers flew, anyone who said that so a person can fly was right. That was <laughs> the fact. And then in an instant, yep, they were taking flight. For the that's the way the story goes for the rest of us. Yeah. But we have to believe that the Wright brothers, it wasn't an instant. There were lots of iterations. And yeah. think about that one for a second. Who is it, Orville or, or his brother, who says, I want to get on this bicycle parts and canvas and wood? Right. <laughs> now, how about, how about I hold the camera and you get on it? So up to the point where somebody got up in the air, it was a fact that was undeniable that you could not fly. Right. Right. Now we take flight for granted. Yeah, just like a phone. Until you and Puff decided to own alcohol, mm -hmm. to actually own it. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I'm not overstating this all the way to going to the fields <laughs> in places like Mexico and others, right? Yep. It wasn't.
possible. It, it was it just was it was impossible. It, if you got anything, you would get a sponsorship deal, mm-hmm. right? Right? Somebody would let you get some cases and they would send it to your little party yeah. and yeah. you would hold them up and you would take a picture and they would pay you a couple of dollars. And then once they paid you a couple of dollars, then you went off and did whatever you did. Take us through that conversation where you and he are where. Yep. Yeah, so, I mean, we're in the old bad boy offices on, um, God, this was 1710 Broadway, I remember. And the yeah. first day, it was Derek Ferguson, also shout out to Derek, was a part of these conversations of saying, um, you know, it, it honestly it just comes back to, like, if we're going to do it, let's do it all the way, right? Like, we're going to put the way, especially the way that group worked, right? Like, the, the way we were, like, we are all in. Everybody in that movement moved like an owner. You treated, it, you treated all those brands like, damn, like, this is my baby, and I'm thinking about it at night and I'm waking up and I have ideas. And it's like, if we're going to be doing that, then we need to participate in the economics like an owner. And the conversation was really just that because it was a thoughtful thing to be like, well, do we really want to get into spirits? And then I was kind of like, we're already in spirits. Right. That's the thing that's a confusing part, I will say. So when you're in the community, you say, oh, you know, these are vice categories. I'm like, well, I worked in pharmaceutical sales in the Department of Defense. Are, th- are those vice categories? It's very arbitrary. Right. So what I do know is there is hopefully, mostly, I mean, my experience, actually mostly responsible consumption in the spirits industry. We are already in the industry. So as we are in the industry, let us participate like owners and not just participating, paying one way, one cocktail at a time. At the biggest tier or the most kind of influential tier in the spirits industry, the average employee makes about $99,000 and they drive about $1.2 million of top line revenue. That's a nice job. You should have those jobs. Like, you know I mean, and it's a nice job. And if you're doing it right, it's a nice outcome for the supplier. It's good for the employee. It's good for the company. And if the employee's doing it right, my view is that's a future founder. They're learning the industry. They go and they can come out and now they can start their own thing. For us not to participate equivalent um, to the way we participate in buying, it's just not acceptable. And the good news is we can change it. I mean, we can change it and we're going to change it. You then have to call somebody who is a producer of spirits. Take us through that conversation that who makes that call? Like how, you, you're clearly not going to the internet. Like, uh, how does it, like, you think <laughs> it wasn't even a thing. Google was, Google was just getting to be a thing at that time. Um, no. So we were already um, working with Diageo. They were sponsoring the bad boys of comedy uh, tour that we were doing at that time with HBO. And um, so we were having a relationship, and this wasn't the first time. As you can imagine, Puff was known for, and still known for, legendary parties. He had had spirits companies reach out for endorsement opportunities all the time. The difference here was we're not interested in an endorsement deal. We were interested in a real business deal um, where we're treated like partners. Um, and so we, we knew who we were having the conversation with. It was, it was the content of that conversation, I think, that was new. That must have been shocking to them because they thought they were about to hire another shuck and jive. No, I wouldn't say that. Look, I still think that um, what we did together was revolutionary. And it was revolutionary because of the combination. Like even at Lobos uh, 1707, where I am now to tequila with LeBron James, is our kind of motto is like, if there isn't room at the table, we build a bigger table. But I really do mean a bigger table with everybody at the table. So we were really able to be really successful because we knew how to move the culture. Right. We knew how to be like not just some some one off whack. Oh, we're doing a black history. We're like, no, we every day showing uh, this community in a, in a glamorous way, in a global way, in a joyful way um, that hadn't really been shown at that time in 2007. Um, but at the same time, our partner brought skills that we had to learn. We didn't know how to negotiate glass or negotiate distributor points, things like that. And the, the reason why that brand was ridiculously so successful up a thousand percent and over a hundred zip codes in the first eight months is because of the strength of the combination. And that's when you mentioned earlier, like, not that I'm opposed to, um, I'm not opposed to protest at all. Sometimes you, you, we see what move we've seen recently, how protests can move things forward. I don't think enough attention is, pay, is paid to economics as a civil rights tool. So that's just what I'm personally leaning into of saying like, yeah, we want to participate. I want to see, I'm very loyal right, to underserved communities and to women. Um, but there's another way in, and I think the way in is to make sure we are getting we are getting our wealth for our community. I have an eight-year-old daughter. I want to make sure that the work that I'm doing will go past me, and that's very hard to do when you just work at a job. When you look at the impact mm-hmm. of what you are doing, I think it's 
it, I say presumptuously, you take it for granted. I don't think that you could understand what it looks like from the outside. Mm -hmm. And let's just start off, finish up with what we're talking about with uh, you and Puff. From what to what in terms of success? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, so what numbers did you move? So brand was just not profitable at all. And uh, it was doing- That's Ciroc. Ciroc was not yeah, profitable. Ciroc Vodka, so sorry, Ciroc Vodka was doing, was with this. And by the way, so Ciroc Vodka was with Diageo, who is the biggest- like in the United States, huge, amazing resources, multinational, multi-billion dollar company. Um, but it's not easy for those big companies to launch, like to get that beginning, right? To get the beginning of drawers of the brand. Um, five years out. Um, and it had gotten to about 70,000, 775,000 cases. Um, within our first seven months, we were up to 160,000 cases and we were growing crazily month over month to at its height, Globally, it was about 2.6 million case brand where it had previously been 70,000 cases worth multiple, you know, worth around $2 billion. Um, so it's, um, and the thing is even bigger is, and this was something we were really intentional about, was it was great when we built at Combs Enterprises, but we were going around hiring diverse suppliers, diverse agencies. You don't, you don't think about, I'll never forget when we launched the Rock Peach, it was such a success that um even independent liquor stores were making so much money we were one time touring our uh, puff and i were doing like a like a thank you tour in atlanta and this liquor store owner came to me and said he said this year i sent my daughter i paid for my daughter's college tuition off of Ciroc peach this is one liquor store in atlanta and it's just like you don't think about you know how much impact you can have when you are including everybody to be able to participate when you have these kind of success stories in a brand so this is what it means when you say, if there's not enough room at the table, you make a bigger table. Because what I hear you saying is that it wasn't just enough for you and Puff to get paid or for Diageo to get paid, but in fact, to create opportunities for freedom, freedom. along the way. And in, in the category, like, let's speak. we were very happy and delighted to see because the world is abundant. We do want to eviscerate the door. So like there's another hundred brands that can't, some didn't succeed, but people participated when it was like, well, damn, this thing is working. Can we do a deal like this? So you saw a bunch of other artists and talent and luminaries and notables get incredible deals. Right now we're in the midst of a celebrity tequila explosion. Rest assured, the success of Ciroc underpinned all of that today. The the Rock and Ryan Reynolds, all these are the, that was the beginning of that. Um, so we've been able to grow this industry in a way that's meaningful. When I talk about build a bigger table, when we were building Ciroc, our competition price wise was like a was like a Grey Goose or a Belvedere. And at that time, we you know we were getting all the word that Grey Goose, are, you know, they over there, they talking about y'all in the conference rooms, they concerned, they worried about losing their share. Maybe they did for a bit. But today in 2021, Great Goose is a billion dollar brand and Ciroc is a billion dollar brand. So my point is that the world is abundant. We talk about building a bigger table. It does not have to always be a sum zero game. Then you became CEO of Lobos. Yes, yes. You know, <laughs> to suggest that you went from the top to the top would be an <laughs> understatement. You went from arguably one of the greatest entertainers and entrepreneurs of all time to one of the greatest entertainers and entrepreneurs of all time. <laughs> and I know you won't answer to this, so I'll, I'll start it with, a, with an answer. You fit among that group. You understand how to engage people who have a, who could have a cadre of yes people around them. Hmm. You have a way of offering up the truth. We're going to get into the business side of it, but let's just talk about that. There's yeah. a, talk about how you offer up the truth to people who do not necessarily <laughs> peddle in the truth. It's not with the currency, <laughs> right? This is me saying, it's not you. You ain't got to say it. It's me saying it. <laughs> Tell me how you sell the truth where the truth is not always for sale. 
Well, <laughs> that's a good point. Well, what I would say is I think I live in the inevitability of things, right? So let's take away, I'm just like, yo, let's pull away the things that are, are fake and insincere and not going to happen. Like, it's just a waste of everybody's time. And honestly, almost everything I do in my life is rooted in my respect for time. So like, I'm not going to be in the business of malarkey when we're in pursuit of something greater than ourselves. And I think people need sometimes, um, you know, to be persuaded about their greater calling, right? You know what I mean? So, and that, and that it's is so always- Because that's exactly what she does. Yes, persuaded about their greater calling. That's how you do it. That, that's how you frame it. That was smooth. You could be a pimp. There you go. I want to talk to you about, I want to persuade you about your greater calling, sister. I do. I mean, I think like, um, I don't know. I mean, you know, I mean, I think you kind of, kind of just grew up in that time. It was a special time, I think, growing up in New York when hip hop was born. I feel like we, you know, it was almost like what it must have been like growing up when jazz was taking off, right? So we always, when we would go out here, we were all types, and you had to learn how to maneuver in any environment, right? So I do. I think I pride myself on being impactful in any room. You, if I have to go talk to sociopaths in the prison. The, the royal family in, in, you know, anywhere in the world. Um, I, I think I'm good at providing an empathy-driven vantage point to drive something forward. And I think the bigger thing is I am very, um, maybe this is actually almost a, a, a little bit of a selfish point of view. And I said this to Puff and, and you know, I said, look, I'm, what's most important to me is like, I'm going to do what I say I'm going to do, right? So like nobody's going to get in the way of that. Right. So if me and you agree to something like and I'm going out on my word, we're going to we're going to do it like because <laughs> I can't because my greatest superpower is people believe that I do what I say I'm going to do. Right. I don't take that lightly. I think that's a very big thing. So if we're all on the journey and we hold the hands on that. We got to do what we said we're going to do. That's just being a conscious yeah, human being. There's that, too. Right. But it's yeah. also you have this capacity really well developed to be able to be in a room full of the biggest men on earth mm -hmm. and not be seen for just your beauty. Um, I, I mean, that part's obvious, but equally obvious is your skill set. Talk about how you've developed the skill set for you to be in a room and to be seen as the expert, because I want—I don't—I don't, I don't want anyone who's who hasn't seen you work to think that I'm talking about you as an equal. That's not true. It's actually, <laughs> not true. It's just not true. If Dia's in the room, she's the expert. That's just that. So if you're if you're in the room, you're not the expert. Congratulations. <laughs> the expert hey, well, can somebody conversate my husband? Is that, <laughs> yeah, well, that part I, that part I cannot have. That, that, that's, not <laughs> that's a different conversation for a different night. Come on, Dia. I'm trying to be grown now. So, so. When you're the expert in the room, I, I, I need you to talk about how it is that you can manage your expertise because you got to, right? Let's be adults here. How do you manage your expertise yeah. such that it is welcomed and sought? Because you meet you meet people, men and women who come in, they got to tell you where they went to school, what they what their GPA was, <laughs> where, where their mother went to high school. You know, like they, you're not that person. It's just, it's just never relevant in what you do. Talk about how you manage that. Because I think a lot of people could benefit from that skill. So I think, um, I do really think it's empathy and information that drive things forward. I also think it's a certain amount of grace. I mean, I definitely, I think about like my grandmother who, you know, they came up at a time, not just me, actually a, lot of my, a number of my friends' grandmothers, when we look back at them and they were so fly and so brilliant and had to be so measured, right? Because they were like black women in a period of time where they were not taken seriously. So they had to be really thoughtful about, well, I'm going to make my point and try to convince something in a way where it's graceful and impactful. Now, we are in a, we should be in a different times now, but truthfully, we haven't really moved that far from that. And whether it's good or bad, I think that balance of clarity, strength, and efficiency of words. I also am big about, like, I'm not wasting your time. I'm going to try to get to the point, right? But at the same time, I'm, I'm legitimately, like, kind of always, like, happy and grateful to be around. It doesn't matter who the audience is, and my Uber driver or, you know, the multi-billionaire world like i'm kind of appreciative to be in the room i think people do sense that my intentions are good for all of us um but also that i'm not going to waste your time or my time right and i think that gives a level of respect of like i don't and i don't necessarily you know i have a lot of respect for certain things like i think like 
bridge building is incredible. Like I'm a, I'm a, I would be like a groupie for like, you built that bridge? Oh my God. But beyond that, I'm not in any room I'm in, I'm not really going to be moved by, um, you know, some, your, your, your Instagram following, right? You know no, what I mean? You're definitely not. You're definitely not. <laughs> you definitely, you definitely you no, 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 that is not you. You are not moved by the size of, uh, of your Instagram, we'll call it now. And, and, but I've seen you manage your room, mm -hmm. whether, and, and I've seen you manage all parts of the room with a grace. I've seen you put your arm around certain people, get them to go somewhere. I've seen you correct other people. I've seen you do it in very expensive high heels. <laughs> and Hi, listen, height hi, hi helps, by the way. You know the study listen, show. Hey, <laughs> hey, I, I don't, I don't I, just that alone. That part alone is impressive, just the, the heels. But I've seen you do it in such a way that no one questions why you're there. That's the part I really want to get to. I've never been in a room with you, and I'm sure when you're with LeBron, nobody's like, why the hell is she here? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the response is typically, why did we wait so long to get her here? How do you... I think it's a kind of gravitas you have to have in a room and know that you belong there. Um, I used mm. to talk about... Um, I mentioned earlier I was a promoter, and... Um, it was me and some other young, you know, some other girls. And in the that time, I don't know how much it changed now, but you're in a nightclub, you got to be like an NFL expert dodging somebody, smack you on the butt or grabbing you up. And I um, got a clipboard because <laughs> I noticed, I just got a clipboard for myself and I noticed a dramatic change from literally one night to the next. And if I had a clipboard, to do, guys were like, oh, oh excuse me, uh, miss, where's the restroom? And there's a whole it's different really environment, right? Really and so then I went back to Staples and bought clipboards for all the promotional models I work with, all the girls. And they were all reporting back. They said, they said, yo, this clipboard is magic. Like, and <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's a ludicrous thing to think you have to have a prop to be taken seriously. But I've mentally always made, kind of call it like the clipboard effect for myself. So as I got older and That's got a book, you know. That's a book, you know. That's a book. There are some, I see someone as an author appear. I see that, that is a book. That okay, is, good. you're the just giving effect. yourself. It's a real thing. And I think it matters that, um, that I feel very good about being at the table in any room. And it's that kind of, uh, I don't know, metaphorical clipboard, right? Of like, I have done, I have done the work. I know there is no, nothing I can't learn. There is no place I shouldn't be. Honestly, just the science of all human beings have 99.5% the same genome. Nobody's that much different in any room. Like aliens come look at us, they're gonna be like, why are these ants arguing, right? So that to <laughs> me is always like the thing too, of like, I'm going to, make the room better and i'm not just that's not just puffery right we can no it's not no it's not that when you have diversity of thought you make more money people stay around longer people are happier so i know when i'm in the room i'm not just um no one's doing me a favor and i'm not even just necessary i'm improving the room and i don't mean that me singularly as dsms right i mean that as diverse people no 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 you but you could stay there because and, and it, i know that it, you guys who are watching could, don't understand how hard it is for Dia to have this conversation because it's <laughs> it's her interest to talk about everyone else and everything else and to speak on the brand. And I am making her talk about things that I'm sure she's going to go back and think, I should, I, it's not even how I think. I don't think, <laughs> like, why am I doing this? But my job is no dumb questions is ask you questions that, no, that I got you. I feel you. So because I want, I want people to hear in you why it is that you are the woman are the person who two of the most powerful men of all time have called on not just to have in the room. Neither one of these cats no. needs somebody in the room. They're, they're not that guy. Neither one of them, that's not who they are. That, that, those, those men are clowns. And we've, we've seen them. Neither of these men are those men. They're not. They are not. They're not no. clowns. They're the real deal. They are serious and they are committed. About yes. their business. And... Yes. Yeah. No matter what you think of what you see of them out in public, sure. no matter what you think, you're wrong. These <laughs> men are the real shit. Like they yeah. come to play. Absolutely. That's and to win. And, and they don't have win. any time for anyone in the room who ain't trying to annihilate yeah. the competition. Not yeah. close. No, I, listen, I come to win unabashedly. And I think we, that is sense. And I think, um, 
I also think we're like just a maximum efficiency. I mean, they, <laughs> I feel like for your point for me to say it, but anyway, they would call me like the cupcake assassin for a reason, right? Because like one, I'm a joyful person, right? So I'm a, I, I literally would like bake cupcakes and have happiness, I've seen but I have no time, right? For if we are not moving forward commercially for the culture, for our people, I will not stand still. Um, so I will be an assassin about winning, about goal achievement, about treating our people right. No, no time for the nonsense. And I think that they, people, especially at their level of winning, right, where they have so many people who depend on them, one, and then they're what they mean is so much bigger than them as individuals that they don't have time, I think, to be surrounded by people who don't understand that and don't move in that same, you know, that same ethos. There are so many people who will grace the cover of magazines who will be, well, if there are magazines in the next year, then what's left of them. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that, was, that was me showing my age. I'm talking about magazines. But uh, who, who will be on the uh, on the front page of Yahoo or Google. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what people don't know is that there's a Dia Sims who is not really checking for that, who, who isn't at all moved by that. No. What moves you? Because you're in the room when that happens. You're in the room with the people who who, is, who dig the celebration. What's your motivation? Freedom. I mean, for me, everything I do is to get to utter and complete freedom to move how I want to move, when I want to move with my family. Um, so I think, you know, it, kind of save the accolades just to dough, but it's not about the cash per se. It's about the cash giving you the access to freedom. Coming out of, um, or <laughs> I don't know if we're coming out, but going through this uh, pandemic, right? You know, there were days, and not just the pandemic, right? Pan the, the, not just the, um, not just COVID, right? We had a ton of pandemics <laughs> happening, if you will, right? On, on just, just, it was just been tough times. And, um, you know, there's times when my husband and I were seriously like, I mean, you, Dr. Perry, you and I talked about this, of like, I don't know. I love, I love, I'm a proud American. Like I really do still believe in this country, but there were times I'm like, I, I don't know. We may have to just go. We just have to go. And I, for me, need the freedom that if my husband and I look at each other and we're like, we just not doing this. We're going someplace else. I don't want to be like, well, let me wait till my check. When, let me look at my pay scale. Like, you know what I mean? So for me, I'm motivated by like, I want the full freedom to spend my time doing the things that I love, like building pronghorn and building brands and making sure and building a system on how we can have a long-term change for all the civil rights issues that we're facing right now. You approach civil rights from a perspective that is only seen by the likes of a Vernon Jordan. Mm -hmm. And we often overlook the importance of the person who bailed Dr. King out. You said a mouthful there. We often undermine those people who are black who can find a way to be the black person in the room and still be black yes and we as a community are all too willing to pull someone's card so to speak when they are too successful <laughs> there's a there's a pathology within our community and and you can look across uh nations and find that the that the group that is represented by the lowest rung in that nation often feels that way towards right. those who aspire or even ascend to higher heights you don't just move within the space of of business you're about to make another man great uh in the sense that He's pretty, he was pretty good to start. <laughs> he wasn't going to be governor yet. So. <laughs> oh, well, yeah. <laughs> no. I, I, I'm, I'm keeping your personal business to you. Yeah. <laughs> but you, in addition to working with LeBron James, mm -hmm. and, and, and I do want to take a second to talk about what it is you do there. Sure, yeah, yeah. And, and what it is you guys are working on. But I want to also give folks the nod that there's a brother running for governor. And yes. I would say the second or third person he called was Dia Sims. Mm -hmm. And the first was his wife, <laughs> who just so happens to be Dia's best friend. And, and he knows better than not make that next phone call. Him. <laughs> so we're going to talk about Wes and you yes. and the work that you're doing in politics. But I do 
because I want people to understand that here's a sister from New York, mm-hmm. father's a cop, mm-hmm. appropriately middle class, mm-hmm. goes to Morgan, goes to work for the government. That's to borrow from uh, Shaka Khan, every woman. Right? <laughs> that story is over and over and over again. You refused to leave it there. Yeah. yeah. And you keep refusing to leave it there. Like you just keep refusing to, to, to do that. When you were approached, because I know you were, uh, as, as free agents go, you were approached often. And I do think it is important that we acknowledge in this time when people quit a job just because somebody looks at them funny. It's like dealing with seventh grade girls in, in middle school right now. You can't say that anymore. Yeah. Claim because it's true. I work with seventh grade girls. Well, um, that's true. <laughs> no, I can say it because it's damn true. Um, fickle as they are. But I know that you were sought after for quite some time by a lot of folks. Mm-hmm. You didn't move. You rode with Puff for 14 years. Yeah. Hard. Yeah. Through, through, through the things that many people would define him by, you were there. Good, bad, or indifferent. Mm-hmm. You were there. Then you decided not to be. Yes. To the extent that you feel comfortable, talk about the decision because a lot of people have to make really hard decisions as to what they're going to do with their career. Not the people who quit on everybody. I don't want to even talk about them. They yeah. Yeah. I'm talking about people who put in the work and built something and could have said, look, I'm not leaving shit. Look, that's mine. I'm not leaving that. Talk about that decision and then how you ended up where you are. You know what? The thing is, kind of even throughout my time with with, with Puff, almost every role I had could have been a stop. Like when I was Puff chief of staff, it's a unique position where I got to learn about the entire around the company and and really like, you know, learn so much. And a, a lot of people I've seen over the years, actually stopped there, which is nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I was like, let me take, I'm asking for things that when I asked to run Chirac and build the agency, we had no guarantee that it was going to be successful. You know what I mean? So I think always it was just like, what is the next thing where I can learn more, where I can be more empowered and move forward? After 14 years working with Puff, the brand was incredibly successful. Um, and I also just felt like I needed to have a new frontier. I also wanted to have more, continue to have even more leadership. Right. Like Puffet empowered me in many ways, but we really were lockstep together. I was like, I want to go to the next phase. I want to continue to have more and more ownership because entrepreneurship is incredibly important to me. And I want to walk it like I talk it. So ultimately, you end up with LeBron. I know there were stops in between. Yeah. But but ultimately, you end up with LeBron James. Big deal. Yes. But you also start your own work in the meantime because you got tree jobs (laughs) yes can you talk about the work that you're doing with black women in spirits Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and, and some of the work you're doing there yeah so i got i got one job which is uh with with, uh (laughs) with lebron and i'm an owner right so i wouldn't be doing it if we weren't uh part of the ownership group and it's been an incredible run and I, i just i think it's worth saying lebron has um been incredible to work with a gentleman shows up early, committed to the business, and has you can see the discipline of a champion show up in the way that he's approached his business. Um, and he's been can you a, talk a little about that because I don't think people get to know that part of him. Yeah, they, yeah, I don't. I think because you're um, wondering whether he or Jordan are the greatest of all time. Yeah, but I think you know it's hard to. I think we take for granted, um, you know, the level of discipline um, to be a super champion in the history of this sport or really all sports that 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 kind of discipline is 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 so intense and i have so much respect for it and um and it and it shows up like his even the simple story of let's let's even take that piece of it away even the simple story of you know it's him and his three friends from high school that now today are winning each in their own way with Mav and it was publicly announced that Maverick Carter's Spring Hill Studios is now, you know, $750 million valuation, whether it's, you know, what uh, Rich Paul is doing with Clutch is one of the best agents in, in the industry, whether it's what LeBron is doing. Like, Literally this, changed the game. This has changed Paul. the game. from Literally. Like, so, like they changed the rules. They have a rule. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you can't be another Rich Paul. You, you can't, you know what I'm saying? And it's just like, I don't think, you look at LeBron and, and what LeBron has accomplished is incredible. 
but it's even more incredible that he is surrounded by people who have also succeeded his dear friends from high school alongside with him. At, at Lobos, Lobos means uh, wolves. And we use this Kipling quote all the time, which is for the strength of the pack is the wolf and the strength of the wolf is the pack. And LeBron really resonated with that out the gate because he was like, this is this is what it means to be part of a team. This is what it means for me and my crew. Like we don't, we don't, we want to each be great, but we want to all be great. For me, and I think I feel like, you know, we've never had this direct conversation, but even this is how I feel is, you know, in some ways winning alone to me is not really that much better than losing, right? Like we out here trying to do it so that we can mm. all win. Like that's the joy. That's the actual celebration. Like what we you out, you say, know, it ain't no fun if my homies can't have none. <laughs> I think you were talking about something different. That's though. close. That's close, but yeah, a little <laughs> different. Um, so what I have loved about this brand is we, you know, we're 50% women on purpose. We're 66% ethically diverse on purpose. We are majority, minority owned on purpose, right? And because of that, like we're being commercially successful. We're tripling our forecast because of that, not in spite of it, right? And um, so I'm excited to to build a brand, you know, again. Um, but in today's climate with today's need that we can be audacious about like, yo, we're just doing a damn thing over here. Um, and we're doing it to represent our community and honor our community. And in terms of the, um, initiative, I think you were referencing called, uh, pronghorn, which I'm going to be mindful of time, but is named after the second fastest land mammal in the world. Second only to the cheetah. It's called the pronghorn. There's nobody knows about this animal, but the reason why we chose it is it, the cheetah will beat the pronghorn in a sprint, but in a marathon, a pronghorn will win every single time. They can go up to 55 miles an hour. If you're in Montana driving, they ride, you're going to be like, whoa, it's crazy. Um, and when we talk about trying to catch up for centuries of inequities, we need to go fast and we need to go far. And the pronghorn represents that mission. And what we have developed with extensive modeling is a template on how to effectively diversify any industry. We're starting with the spirits industry, this $353 billion industry where we need more participation, equal participation, or rather pro rata participation. And we are starting with the Black community in the U.S. We'll be open code. And as we continue to build it, we're looking forward to other industries doing it. We're looking forward to serving other populations. We're investing in 57 Black-owned founders over a decade, and we're driving 1,800 new entrants into the supplier tier at these incredible, like, these are some incredible jobs, by the way. Like, I never knew about being like a master of whiskey when I was, <laughs> I was like, you do some cool job. Yeah. I think our community should participate in. At the end of 10 years, the black community will have pro rata representation as founders and as employees and throughout the supply chain. And we, I won't go into it now, but there's another piece around a bunch of supercharging elements we're putting in place to kind of even the fields that are difficult to get across, right? This is a hard industry to get in if you don't understand it. So we are putting all the resources to bear coming like full strength along with cash, along with training, along with placements to change the entire industry. All right, we, we will change the industry. And actually it's exciting because the industry is on board. What I find most compelling about what you just said is how you talked about being a owner in Lobos as part of a story, but not the end. Oh, right. no. I think that people need to understand what it is that you just said. Those bottles represented behind you represent yes. your family's interest. There we go. <laughs> represents your family's yes. legacy. Yes. That, people see LeBron James, but they don't understand Dia Sims. That, that's her daughter. Yes. That's going to benefit from that. And her yes. great granddaughters. When y'all are, listen, folks, I need people to understand. We look at someone like Madam C.J. Walker, as we should, as we should. And people had issues with what she sold, if we're going to be honest, right? Yeah. They, they, like the, what she was selling was, was a sense of whiteness to the black community. Yeah. And, and we had issues with that. And now we got issues with alcohol. Got it. Cool. Whatever. I'm whatever, whatever you need to do inside who you are to deal with what it is that you're dealing with. But what I'm looking at it as is this. We have a CJ Walker in our midst and it is our obligation to support the CJ Walkers because I got a bunch of them in our schools that I I'll share with you very briefly. So uh, yesterday I'm in Harlem and people should know that Dia uh, was on our board for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And uh, at our school in Harlem, it, 
all of our schools, all of our capital prep schools, every kid has to apply to four year colleges because that's what we do. And um, so one of our seniors, a uh, young lady said, I'm not applying to any colleges. I said, well, you should pick another school. She got up and walked out the room and left. Okay. Today I went in the room and she was sitting there. I said, can I holler at you for a second? Yeah. I said, thank you. Thank you for trusting me. Then I got you. She said, I'm not going to get into college. We're not there yet, babe. We're not there yet. One of the schools she's looking at is Morgan. In your very presence, you represent the hopes and dreams of our ancestors and the young ladies who don't think it's possible. Who's who are afraid to dream big dreams because so much of their life has been beaten into a pulp and pulverized. Yeah. And so we have to take the time to shine the light on you and say, whoa, 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 hold on a second. Everybody stop. Stop doubting yourself. Stop hating on this other one over here. Cut this mess out. You are looking at what our community can produce when our community gives what our community deserves, which is the shine that it should to people like you. Um, I, I say that sincerely. Uh, I know we're coming to the top of the hour and you and I Dia, can do this and we'll do it again because I don't, I, I hate that we didn't have enough time and it comments are like so many people want to jump in. I see all your comments and I where I, I, I really wanted to ask your questions, but I really didn't because I had some questions myself. You're going to have to wait till she comes back. <laughs> yeah. I, thank you. Uh, oh, thank you, Elaine Cato. Just so you know, Elaine Cato is a, is a sister who kind of looks similar to you and she invented a bra. Yes, I love that. We need that. <laughs> she invented she invented a bra that is um, backless. So there you go. Very impressive. For, for healthy chested women. <laughs> well, that's what you call innovation. That's what you yeah, man. <laughs> yeah, man. Yeah, man. We used to work together a long time ago. And, and, oh, uh, very nice. and, she, very nice. and she too had a dream. So. I, I do want to quickly say uh, I, I know I know I'm I'm running out of time and everybody's waving at me like you gotta go you gotta go but <laughs> y'all can relax a freaking second um I got coffee <laughs> so and my son uh, but you now are in politics not in but just like you do in right <laughs> you do in in the way that uh. You know, sorry, it's sad that Avant's wife has died, but Avant does uh, been yeah, murdered. But, tragedy, but you do, you do you do politics like he does politics. Listen, I, listen, I will take that. Uh, I will absolutely take that. That is high praise for sure. Well, you know, I'm true. interested in being effective, right? I am not interested. I do not care whether anyone knows, frankly, my name or not. I want to make sure we land the results that are good for all of us. And um, you know, as you talk about Wes Moore, who's running for governor of Maryland. Um, it, it, this is somebody who is, you know, heart led but math based and understands how to actually solve problems. The governor of any individual state in this country is really bigger, frankly, than any state. I don't think we always realize the impact of governors um, and things that happen in like the governors of Texas affecting the whole country or the governors of Florida affecting the whole country. Um, somebody like Wes, who is brilliant um, and kind and uh, combat veteran and just on an old, you know, Rose Scholar, just everything you could possibly think of, but more importantly, a good human being, godfather to our, you know, to our daughter. Um, him becoming governor of Maryland is not, frankly, and I live in Maryland, so it's important to me for my state, but it's important because in the history of this country, we have had two black governors. It's entirely preposterous. Just again, it's just the math of it. It just makes no sense. There's no, um, and he is, um, he's honestly unimpeachable. Right, there is nothing like he is. He is beyond perfect uh, to run any state and any country and any sovereignty, really. Um, so I think 
we have to look at diverse leadership, black leadership, more women in leadership as a national matter. So if you're not familiar with Wes and Dawn Moore, please give them a Google, please follow them because I think, again, this is much bigger than that state. Maryland is considered to be a um, microcosm, right? Basically of the, of the United States when you look at the demographics, it's important state. It's actually the wealthiest state in the nation, a lot of people don't realize. So it is very important and you look at like the way America goes a lot of times starts in Maryland. Um, so I am excited and this is a labor of love, anything I can do to support them because they're just incredible humans. Well, I want to say this again, and now, now everybody's jumping up and down, like, you got to go, you got to go. Here's okay. the deal. <laughs> okay, right. so, so, so here's what we, we deal. We got to do this again. Okay, um, I'm happy to we, do it. We, we really do have to do it again um, because we didn't even scratch the surface uh, of what you do. Um, it, we didn't get in touch. We didn't talk about cannabis. Um, there are a bunch of things that uh, other interests that you have that we've not discussed. But what I hope people took from this is that Greatness is not behind us. It's among us and in front of us. And we, especially black people, and those people call themselves our allies, y'all too, have to embrace this. Y you have to. And nothing that you've heard Dia talk about tonight has she talked about in the absence of others. Mm -hmm. It's all about expanding opportunities. You heard her say that once Chirac took off, a whole bunch of people got opportunities. Yeah. And that we can all eat when we do it the right way. There's a bounty here. Those are the, the platitudes. But what I've had the opportunity to see firsthand is an elegance and grace in the way in which you handle yourself. Mm -hmm. Unflappable. Uh, it, Dia can have the shortest conversation in the world with you and get a lot done. She, <laughs> I, I think that she's used to paying a cell phone bill that you have to pay by the minute. That's what, <laughs> Dia can call you. It is every bit of 36 seconds, the entire conversation. All the time. That's the thing. I'm trying to get like, you can get a, people very much underestimate. You can get a lot done in seven minutes. She and is not I playing. Mean that. I mean, <laughs> efficiency is an understatement because yeah. she respects time. And yes. I don't think that yours. people do. Yes. <laughs> and so did I can't thank you enough for who you oh, are. Oh, this is such a listen, I you know, I I I expect I will be on you to be able to come back and I always love when we have a chance to catch up. And thank you for all the work that you're doing to advance the community and those beautiful children and the hundred percent graduation rates we have going to four-year colleges is um, you know, it's nothing short of miraculous. And it's the kind of thing we need to see at more schools around the country. So I would also ask if you're listening, please support Capital Prep any way you can with your time or your dollars or just even supporting our Instagram or sending scholars our way. And what Dr. Perry has developed, I think is really world-class and innovative. And it's something that to the point of abundance, you know, I pray for today, we see it in all schools that all our children get this type of character building and respect to give them the foundation to excel academically. So thank you, Dr. Perry. I appreciate you. And let, let me say this folks, Dia is a mom. Dia is a a wife. She cares about her family. What she has mastered is not work-life balance because work-life balance is a silly notion. What she has mastered is work-life alignment. Mm -hmm. The people in her life get it. They understand this is what mommy does. This is what my wife does. And this is what we do. Yeah. There's a lot that you could learn from this. I hope y'all actually watch this again because there are things that I'm I'm sure that you miss. I see folks are I see you guys. I, I know you all have questions for Dia next oh, time. So, bad. So, oh. you know, so next next time Dia okay. what we're gonna do is I'm just gonna sit back. I'm gonna allow I love I love a QA. That's my favorite thing. So I know I know and I'm gonna and I'm gonna uh, Deb I, I I am definitely going to uh all the folks who are, are, are all through here, sisters are literally applauding. You have oh, uh, touched some you. souls tonight. They are greatly appreciative of the work that you do. Uh, again, I, I see you. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> She's coming back. She's coming back. She's coming Definitely. back. Coming back. She's coming back. Exactly. And, and we're going to talk. We're going to talk more about the work she does. I hope that you appreciate that. I didn't want to start with who she's worked with. Because I don't think that the story of Dia Sims is who she's worked with is quite frankly, who's worked with her. Thank you. Thank you so much. Folks, I want to thank you so much for joining us tonight on No Dumb Questions. This is what we do. Uh, we talk to smart people who are doing great things and uh, who are moving our culture forward.
-hmm. You don't always have to appreciate what they say, but God knows you have to appreciate what they do. And I don't believe that the smartest person in the room is the one with the best answers. I want is I believe it's the one with the best questions. And so please make sure that you take the time to ask a good question because it is too easy to get caught up in your own voice and miss the lessons that you could learn from others. Dia taught us a lot tonight. She put on a master class. And if you learned anything from her this evening, you learned that there is a way to make an impact without ever being seen. But the work that you do speaks volumes. Thank you so much to every single one. Thank you so much to the producer of the show. I appreciate y'all. I know I went over my bad. I promise you I'll do it again. And the rest of you, thank you so much for all your questions and comments. I wish I could have gotten to them. We're going to bring Dia back um, because she matters that much to us. Y'all take it easy. Appreciate you. Peace.